Greetings, everyone. My name is Graham Walker. I'm the president of Patrick Henry College. Uh, we are delighted to be launched uh, into our newsmaker interviews hosted by Dr. Marvin Olasky. It is such a joy uh, for both faculty and students to have uh, Marvin Olasky on our faculty. Of course, he holds our distinguished chair in journalism and public policy. Uh, and uh, is busily mentoring and guiding our students. Uh, quite a number of our students have benefited from this incredible relationship with Dr. Olasky and World Magazine uh, through internships and writing opportunities. Uh, our students are publishing things that are popping up not only on their website but in their print edition. Uh, and uh, the whole campus community is benefiting from this wonderful relationship. Also, uh, Susan Olasky is uh, our writer in residence and we always welcome her as part of this uh, wonderful uh, partnership. Uh, today, Marvin Olasky will be interviewing Kay Coles-James, and we welcome you to our campus. As we do so, let me remind you that it's not just the group in front of us here, uh, which will probably grow as the next class gets out, mm -hmm. but also those, uh, uh, we never know quite how many, there can be 100 or so watching us via World Wide Web on our live webcast, and subsequently, there will be the 400 readers of World Magazine who will... 400,000, thank <laughs> you, yes, I meant to say, 400,000 <laughs> readers <laughs> of World Magazine who will participate in this via the written version of these interviews. And uh, the interview today with Kay Coles-James will uh, show us how she became the founder and president of the Gloucester Institute, a nonprofit organization which uh, nurtures and trains African-American leaders. Uh, Kay Coles-James has served as director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management under President George W. Bush, as well as serving as the chair of the Joint Financial Management Improvement Program Principals and chair of the Chief Human Capital Officers Council. She was a member of the President's Management Council and was appointed to serve on the White House Fellows Commission. She has served as Secretary of Health and Human Resources under Virginia Governor George Allen, Chair of the National Gambling Impact Study Commission, Senior Vice President of the Family Research Council, Dean of the School of Government at Regent University, Associate Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, and Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. That is quite a <laughs> resume. Whew. She's also, in amongst doing all that, a writer and has an author of three books, including her award-winning autobiography titled Never Forget. Uh, Kay Coles James is a wife mother of three children and grandmother to five grandchildren. Please welcome Kay Coles-James. So we'll talk in a while about a very exciting project, the Gloucester Institute, but just before we were talking a little bit about the election and so forth, the recent election, you may have heard of it uh, at the beginning of November. Uh, I've seen lots of articles on conservative websites looking at some of the voting patterns mm -hmm. in which there were some precincts, African-American precincts, that voted 100% for Obama. And the insinuation and sometimes the outright declaration on these websites is this must be the result of fraud and corruption and so forth. But I think as we've looked at it, we have a different take on it. And I'd be interested in your analysis of <laughs> can that 100% be real? Is it real? It, it certainly is real. Um, if you have been a part of the African-American community, as I have for all my life, and you understand uh, that community and you understand um, the hopes and dreams and aspirations of people in that community, it should come as no surprise to you that, um, that African Americans would come out in overwhelming numbers. I think the mistake that conservatives most often make and that we in the Republican Party have most often made is assuming that people are voting on the basis of policy analysis and if we just told our story better and if they understood the policy better, they would vote with us. And quite frankly, it has nothing to do with any of those reasons. And I think it has a lot to do with understanding American history, understanding uh, the journey that African Americans have been on in this country, and understanding um, where we are in the depth of our emotions and why that would be such a significant vote. And a, a recent movie, Django, mm. gave you some more insight into <laughs> that. And you know, maybe we can have a little bit of a movie review right here. Oh, it's really interesting. I saw Les Mis and Django in the same weekend. <laughs> and they were like bookends for me. Um, it was 
way more misery than I could tolerate in one 48-hour period, but beyond that, and Russell Crowe singing was just sort of odd. <laughs> but, but, you know, Les Mis was about redemption and forgiveness and hope and aspiration and dreams, and I dreamed a dream. I don't know about you, I cried a lot. Um, and then we saw Django, and Django uh, reminded me yet for, for again. For those not familiar with it, what's, what's the plot? Yeah, Django uh, was a movie about revenge. It was about a slave who had the opportunity to be freed and become a bounty hunter and had a license, therefore, to go and, as he said, go kill white people. Um, and there were, and, and if you know anything about Tarantino movies, I mean, they're always extremely violent and and always about retribution and revenge. Um, for those of us who are culture warriors, it's important to see. For the average person uh, who may be a little skittish about those things, I would not recommend it. Um, but if you are a culture warrior and want to engage the culture and want to understand a lot of the dynamics that are going on in our culture, than you should. Because halfway through that movie, something that I knew I was reminded of yet again. And when you understand the horror of slavery, and when you see it graphically on a screen in front of you, and when it is settled in your DNA, and it has been a part of the oral history of your family, you come to understand why there are large groups of people in this country who say, I don't care if he runs the whole dadgum country off the cliff. I don't care if Obamacare screws up the entire American health care system. We got a black president, and I'm voting for him. And I think if we are interested in solving problems, if we're interested in moving our country forward, we have to understand that dynamic. We have to understand and get inside the heads of people. You know, I saw that movie in an all-black theater with people cheering at what I thought was all the inappropriate times. But we need to understand that that's where people are because you can't get here if you don't understand where we are here. And so in developing long-term strategies and solutions about this country, it is imperative that we understand where people are. I have said to you before, a little earlier today, I am extremely concerned about where we are as a nation and about the inability of the Christian community, the conservative community, the Republican Party to deal with the shifts that are going on in America. And I have said to very conservative audiences recently, I need you to understand the browning of America. I need you to deal with the fact that my grandchildren are gonna be running this country not yours. Mm -hmm. I need you to understand that the Hispanic community and the Asian communities are growing in this country, and we tend to be so insular. We tend, as conservatives, to stay right in our communities, to preach to the choir, to hold rallies where we get ourselves energized, and we are not evangelical in our message. And it concerns me greatly. I, I think we got one more election to lose, like we lost the last one, and then we become irrelevant to American politics. Hmm. Now, last Thursday, we had in here for interviews uh, Tucker Carlson mm -hmm. uh, from Fox and Stuart Taylor, who's just written a book on affirmative action called Mismatch. And both of them ac actually, in terms of race relations, Tucker explicitly, Stewart implicitly were saying, you know, this isn't the 1950s or the 1960s. I mean, you know, we've left all that behind. There's, you know, the, the, the struggles of that period, the civil rights struggle, that's history. And now race is not that big a factor. Uh, 
Is this white folks talking? It certainly is, and I'm glad you said it because I was about to. <laughs> 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 um, you know, I, I, I've lived as an African American in America my entire life. And yes, there have been changes. I was a part of that group that integrated the schools in the South. I had to go past dogs to go to algebra. Um, I, I know what that's like. Overt racism in America is gone. Mm -hmm. uh, it is no longer, incidentally, thank goodness, it is no longer socially acceptable to be a racist. You, you just can't get away with that. Um, but covert racism is alive and well. And I see it every day in very subtle ways. Um, and I could tell you, it, it takes being black to sort of get it, to understand it, uh, to feel it, and to live it. You know, to be standing in a line uh, at a cosmetic counter and to be ignored three times while they wait on the person next to you. Um, you know, it, it, is, it, is, it is sort of ingrained in, in many of us and in very subtle ways that we are not even aware of. Uh, I can tell you when one of my very dearest, best, closest friends became upset because her daughter was dating a black guy. And I went, what, what? <laughs> you know, it, 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 it was confusing to me uh, to be involved in a white church uh, and you're part of a Bible study, and everybody in the Bible study goes on vacation together, but they didn't invite you. Um, you know, I, I appreciate those that want to declare it gone. Uh, yes, we've made great strides in America with our legal system. It's, it, we've made great strides culturally. Uh, there are a lot of things that still need to get worked on in the heart of people in America. Um, and things that are so subtle that they are not even aware that they're there. I am not prepared to declare racism dead and gone in America. So next month is Black History Month. Um, what do kids in school, both white and black, learn about black history during Black History Month? And are, are there things that they are learning that they shouldn't be learning or the things they should be learning that they're not? Well, let's begin the conversation with, I'm not all that big a fan of Black History Month. Okay. I mean, why we get a month, a short one at that? Um, <laughs> um, uh. it, it's American history. Uh, and it bothers me that the contributions that African Americans have made to this country are generally relegated to one month out of a year. And what I want to see is it incorporated. But you know what? Until that happens, I'll take what I can get. I'll take the 28-day month in <laughs> the coldest part of the year when people are usually sad and trying to pay Christmas bills, you know. Leap year sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, how about July or <laughs> August or something? But um, having said that, um, there it, it, it's, it's troubling that um, we still live in a country where we are still... Um, separated in those ways. I wish that every kid in America could learn as a normal part of history what Benjamin Banner could contribute to this country. I wish they knew about Sojourner Truth. I wish that those things, my cousin Oliver Hill and the contributions that he made uh, about Bojangles and if there would be no Shirley Temple without Bojangles. <laughs> You know, I, I, I wish that that was just a part of what we knew about our country and that it were not separated out that way. But if we can shine a light on it once a year and do that, I'll tell you, I'm so concerned when I go into many of our African-American schools and their idea of Black History Month is a talent show where they're doing rap music and performing or uh, the idea for Black History Month is let's celebrate by having a soul food lunch. Now, nobody likes soul food better than I, but that's not really getting back to our heritage and understanding of the tremendous contributions uh, uh, about this country. This, I think, brings us to Gloucester Institute, uh -huh. in a way. And 
Why don't you just tell us a little bit about that? Because this is this is you know after all the the uh, major public offices that you held, and now you're doing this. Yes. And, and tell us why you're doing it and why it's important. Everything that I have done in my entire life was preparation for this. Um, I am currently on the board of the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative public policy think tank in Washington, D.C., and been a part of that board and many, many boards uh, in the Christian community of Focus on the Family, and I've been on the board of Young Life and been on the board of, the co at the time, it was the Coalition of Colleges of Christian mm -hmm. Universities. And, you know, I, I, I at, at some point... I realized I was spending so much of my time in the white evangelical community. Um, I remember one time Charles and I were teaching a class on marriage at our PCA church. And we had all of these young couples in there. And while that was important to do, there were 30 other couples who could do that. But why couldn't we take what we had learned and things that we knew and share them in the African-American community where there were far fewer resources, where they, quite frankly, never even heard a focus on the family? Um, so why were we here yeah. when the need was so great there? So that was one thing. Two, I said to Ed Fulner at Heritage one time, Ed, you can retire uh, and he is, as you know, uh, knowing that you have created an institution that will carry your values, your principles, uh, into the marketplace of ideas for generations to come. As a black, conservative, evangelical, pro-lifer, you know, the list goes on, I have no such comfort. Hmm. Where is the institution that after I have left the planet is the house for that. Where is the place that I know my grandchildren and great-grandchildren will be able to come to think through those things in a culturally sensitive way? So that was two. Three, looking at the shifting demographics in this country, I am fed up annoyed, angry, pick a word. I have probably had a not-so-pleasant conversation with every conservative leader and every Republican leader in America within the last 60 days because they have given up on the black community. Hmm. And now this is a very nuanced point, and I hope it comes through, and I hope you will hear my heart on this. I realized after the last election cycle, particularly as we were going through the phase of analysis, that people were saying, ah, you know, we can't do anything. Those precincts were 100%, write them off. Let's focus on Hispanics and women and maybe youth. Well, I was never involved in the Republican Party because I was interested in growing the Republican Party in the mm -hmm. first place. Newsflash. Uh, I was never involved in the conservative movement because I thought it was a great idea to grow the conservative movement. Hmm. Newsflash. I was involved in both those movements because I thought that the values and the ideals and the principles were the very ones that I needed to save my community. And when they write it off, they therefore have written off my community. And I feel some kind of way about that. Mm -hmm. So they're telling me that I was only an important and significant to the degree that I could help them stay in power and advance their agenda. Mm -hmm. When I was no longer useful for that effort, I am there no longer useful to them. And I feel some kind of way about that. Because I believe in self-sufficiency and independence. Mm -hmm. I believe in principles like don't spend more than you earn. I 
believe in limited government because limited government gives you the most freedom. Mm -hmm. So if you're telling me I'm not going to invest any time and energy in your community because you can't get me where I want to be, then I held a meeting recently with young African-American conservative professionals and said, I have a news flash for you. The cavalry is not coming. Mm -hmm. There is no one coming to save us. The conservative movement, the evangelical movement, and the Republican Party don't care about us anymore. We are no longer the flavor of the month. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so... Because we believe what we believe, it's ours to do. And quite frankly, one of the things that is so, because of my age, I'm 63. I know I look good for 63. Thank you. <laughs> but I am, in fact, 63. It happened on my watch. I saw the deterioration of the African-American community on my watch. I saw us move from an achiever community to a ghetto nihilistic community on my watch. And I honestly believed, because I had been at the forefront of the pro-family movement, of the evangelical community, of the conservative community, leader in the Republican Party, that when I shifted my focus and went over here and said, I want to have a major impact in my community, that they would be there for me. Hmm. But I am no longer useful. And so my I better change my name to Maria Sanchez, and then maybe I can get some attention here. I mean, it, it, it really is. We use people and then spit them out, um, which is very pragmatic, but that's politics. It is what it is. Two questions. Um, <clears throat> first, um, why did you develop, how and why did you develop the principles you've developed with, in many ways, I mean, you were uh, went to went to Hampton Institute. I mean, these are mm -hmm. kind of mainstream black colleges and mm -hmm. so forth and things like that, which have led to the leadership being almost 100 percent for Obama. Why not you? Well, it's interesting. Um, there is nothing that I believe that is weird, unusual or different in the African-American community. J.C. Watts quoted me in his book as the best definition he ever heard of a black conservative. Mm. And I said, a black conservative is nothing more than someone who has the audacity to believe what their grandmother taught them. Mm. I, there's nothing I believe that my grandmother didn't believe. So the distinction comes in, and that's very true about many, if not in fact most African Americans. The difference is how you take that and then translate it into a political agenda. And then when after you come back from seeing Django and we talk, you will understand the concept of that may very well be true, but after you did everything you did to us during slavery, I don't care about your political agenda. I'm going with the folks who understand that, who sense that, who feel that, and who appreciate that. And that was a, as I said, that was a real eye-opener for me yet again. I don't care if, if I mean, I remember giving a pro-life speech at this church out in California, and I mean, I was on my A game. Mm -hmm. and, and I had the church going, and they were amening and uh huh and we are there with you, and the pastor got up and said, we're not going to let Sister James fight this fight alone, are we, church? And I go, no. We're not going to let Sister James be on the battlefield by herself. No. 
We're going to build a living hedge of protection around Sister James, aren't we, church? Yes. Okay, and the Jesse Jackson T-shirts are on sale, and it was when he was running for president. I said, what just happened here? How did we go from that to the Jesse Jackson T-shirts are on sale in the basement of the church? And I think I get it now, and I think fundamentally what people involved in politics don't get is that there is an absolute disconnect between what we believe in our hearts and how we vote. Because if I think, if I even think you're a racist, mm -hmm. if I even think you don't care about the plight of black people in this country, if I even think that you harbor some of that within your spirit, I'm sorry, I will run this country in the ground before I vote for you. So in a parallel universe, if in 1996, Colin Powell had run for and gotten the Republican nomination instead of Bob Dole, would he have carried most nope. of the black vote? No. Nope. And, and so why is that? So because it's not he's just associated with the Republican Party and because people in the African American community do not trust the Republican Party. Well, I mean, you go see the movie Lincoln and you come to understand and Republicans are quick to tell us you know, about the history of the party and we were the party that abolished slavery and we were the party. And, you know, and, and there's some great movies out that tell the story. The first black everything in this country was a Republican, just so you know, whether it was congressman, senator, governor, whatever, all Republicans. And that's great, but then you have to ask yourself, so what happened? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm doing some research on a book right now to talk about so what happened? Well, then you have to come to terms with the Lily White movement in this country where the Republican Party in the South that couldn't win an election because of their association with African Americans um, decided to run black folks out of the Republican Party. And it was a race to the bottom to see who could be more racist, Southern Democrats or Southern Republicans. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I even have a personal connect to that in doing the research, I discovered that I had a relative who was a Mr. Coles from Charlottesville, Virginia, who was unseated at the Virginia State Republican Convention because they were running all the black folks out of the Republican Party in Virginia. And I, I, I have to tell you that it was a very emotional moment for me when I was chairing the Republican Party state convention and looking at that sea of faces and realizing that it was just probably three decades, four decades ago, where my relative was not even allowed to have a seat in the Republican Party. And I recognized, because I'm like not stupid, that, okay, I'm a black female, wouldn't that be nice to have as the chairman running our, you know, and a good Republican, and I've paid my dues, but I didn't miss the fact that I was black and a female during an election cycle where that was important. Um, so I was able to be a symbol for the party at that moment, but did not miss the fact that my, my ancestor had been run out of this party. And people know that history. They know that. They lived it. They experienced it. So you have white Republicans, in a sense, using you. And then you have, you were mentioning before, thinking more about, uh, about Django, the depiction in the movie of the difference between the, the field workers and the house workers. Oh, you're being very kind, but I get it. Go mm -hmm. ahead. OK. <laughs> um, so you don't, so, so you, you don't, you don't get respect there, in a sense. Yeah. I mean, the the yeah. field workers look upon you. So. Where's, where's your community? My community, well, first of all, let's get this straight. I am a part of the kingdom of God. I am the daughter of the most high, and I'm an ambassador here traveling in a foreign land. So we got that straight. Um, secondly, um, they're all my communities. Hmm. Um, yes, those of us who are Black Republicans like to get together when there are no white folks around and talk about how they use us, but we allow them to. They only use us because we let them, because we are pro-life and we do care about that issue. We allow them to use us because we do believe 
in uh, limited government, and we want to fight and make sure that this country stays economically sound. So our agenda, you can use me as long as you're using me for what I want to be used for. And you use them. And I use, yeah, well, not as effectively as they <laughs> use me, but I'd <laughs> like to. <laughs> I mean, if I can ever figure this out, we, we got a good game going on here. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, so it, it's not just that. These are things that I believe deeply and want to be on the forefront of. But I also, rec but I'm, I also recognize that, you know, when, that, yeah, it, it, you, you know when you're being used, of course. And, and it's okay if I agree with it. You can't use me against my will is where I was going with that. So that's fine. Um, you can't out-black me, and you can't love black people more than I love black people. And this is a conversation that I have within the African-American community all the time. Um, I, I defy anyone to question my ethnicity or my love for my people. I am a conservative because I love my people and I believe that conservative values will in fact lift my people, uh, empower my people. In fact, you know, they're not as much conservative as they are biblical values, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, conservative values just happen to overlap with biblical values. Um, so I, I think that when you operate within the African-American community as I do, and people come to understand your heart love for your community, and I tell them all the time, you better be glad there's something called a black conservative Republican to, to be in the room when they're doing crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. You better be glad that there's somebody who can be there to give a different perspective I think what annoys the black community is when someone is in the room and doesn't take the opportunity to bring a different perspective, to, to, uh, to enhance the conversation, to push back a little bit. Um, but quite frankly, the African American community would be far worse off if there were not something called uh, a black Republican. I will never forget uh, this reporter, and I have, re have become friends in recent years, but I remember President Bush leaving uh, uh, to go away on a trip to Africa. We were doing the wave off on the White House lawn, and the president came by and said to Laura, oh, there's Kay, and he waves. And this black reporter writes a story, the last thing, Bush says before he leaves his hi to Kay James, an African-American serving in his administration, what good is it to have them there if they're not going to stand up? And I said, I wish she knew how many beatdowns I had given and how many beatdowns I had taken in just that week. In just that week. But the assumption is that if you are there, you are truly the house worker and not really representing uh, the perspective and the issues. And I told someone once when they called and said, my mother is having problems with her social security. Uh, I was at the Department of Health and Human Services at the time, said, can you help her solve this problem? And I said, I will, but you're gonna hear a lecture first. <laughs> the first thing you need to understand is, if I were not here, who were you going to call? So don't dog me on one side about why are you a Republican, and then as soon as you have a problem in a Republican administration, want to call and ask for my help. Your mother is going to get her problem solved because there is something called a black Republican. Mm. So what you need to understand is no matter who is in power, some of us need to be here. Um. <coughs> We're going to go to questions in a minute, but I do want to ask a little bit more because I, th I think it works here in terms of Gloucester Institute. Yes. And um, the training, and much as the students here at Patrick Henry are trained in liberal arts subjects, not because they're liberal, but because it comes, <laughs> from, the, comes from Latin, <laughs> liber, you know, free, liberty, yes. basically. So the liberal arts are contrasted, we can, we can contrast the liberal arts with the servile arts. 
So my understanding, and again, I haven't been there, but just from what I've read, including in an article in World a year ago, uh, Gloucester Institute, you're really trying to train um, African-American college students in the liberal arts mm -hmm. in terms of exposing them to things that perhaps they are unlikely to get in their own college programs. Right. So tell Let us about that a little bit. Let me talk about that for just a second. Yeah. The Gloucester Institute is decidedly not a conservative organization. Yeah. Um, and that bothers some of my friends on the right a lot. Um, but it isn't. And the reason it isn't is because I wanted to design an organization where conservative thought and ideas had a home and were welcome and could be debated. So I wanted to de develop an organization that could have credibility in the African-American community. We have a lot of black conservative leaders that have zero credibility in the African-American community. I did not want to be one of them. So with a blank slate, I said, what would it look like if you designed an organization that could have credibility in the African-American community where conservative ideas and values could have a home and so what developed out of that was a place where ideas could be debated. I am not afraid of debate. I used to debate for a living. For about five years, I debated the pro-life issue as the national spokesperson for the National Right Life Committee all over the world. It's so debate comes naturally to me. So I said, what if we created an environment where liberals and conservatives in the black community could come together and let the best man or woman win. And, and whenever you take on an issue at the Gloucester Institute, I bring in all sides for the students. And I expose them to people. See, they get one side, so I have to bring in all sides. <laughs> And then I teach them critical thinking because to me the thing that's missing most is the ability of young people to think through an issue and ask the second layer of questions. And so if they have the, I, and I tell them, I don't care if you're a liberal or conservative, I don't really care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, but I do not do stupid. I just can't do stupid, it just makes me ill. And I can't do people who are not thoughtful. You can have any, pos you can tell me, Mrs. James, I think Obamacare is the best policy for this country. And if you can engage in a conversation with me for 15 minutes and convince me that you really understand that particular piece of legislation, and you can defend it, I will leave you alone. But you better be able to do that. I don't do talking points. I don't care what you heard on Comedy Central last night. What's that guy, who, what's his, Dennis, what's his name? Dennis Miller and what's the other one? That, John. oh yes, John Stewart. Everybody thinks he's the, John, you don't even know who, you know who John Stewart is, right? Okay. You, you can't get your political analysis from him, really. So we take issues and dissect them and talk about them and have people defend them. And I have some people who leave my program and say, I, am a, I came in a Democrat, I'm leaving a Democrat, but my gosh, I now understand that there are valid points that conservatives have to make and we ought to be engaged in a conversation. For me, that's a win. And I have young people who came in, I had a young man who came in, been in the program three years, and he asked to see my husband and me on a Sunday afternoon and he came in and he said, Mrs. James, I, I really need to see you and your husband, and can I come over? And I said, yes, and I'm thinking, oh gosh, how this kid had such promise. How has he ruined his life? You know, is his girlfriend pregnant? I mean, what am I dealing with this Sunday afternoon? And he comes in, and you know, I'm making tea and cookies and trying to make this easy because he's obviously nervous. And he sits down and he says, I, I just don't know how to say this, and you're the first person I've said it out loud to, but I came to the realization I, I'm a conservative. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I understand. 
Yeah, I know what that means. We'll walk with you through this one, buddy. <laughs> it's going to be tough. Mm-hmm. But I get it. I get it. And incidentally, I did not know that I was a conservative until a reporter told me. Hmm. I was doing an interview one time, and he asked me about being a black conservative, and I said, what? I am? I honestly, honestly did not know. And I, I said, why, do you, why, why are you saying these things about me? Hmm. You know, because cons- being called a black person conservative is like a dirty word. Like, mm, don't do that. My mother is going to have fits. And, um, and when we walk through what I believed and the definition, I had to come to terms with the fact that I was going to spend my life as a conservative. Mm. So the <coughs> there's, uh, okay, there's John Stewart and there's uh, Colbert. Colbert. Oh, that's sort of the, the one I was the one thinking of. He's kind of Colbert, a, you know, a yeah. pseudo-conservative in a yes. sense or, or a, a parody of conservatism, but not exactly an alternative yes. out there. Um, let me ask one other question before we go to questions from, from y'all. Because um, you mentioned your five years as, as spokesperson for National Right to Life. And uh, those years overlapped, if I, if I remember correctly, the years where Faye Waddleton oh, yes. was, the, was the head of uh, Planned, Planned Parenthood. Parenthood. And so we have, we have here two articulate African-American women. And at that time, this was like 30 years ago, I was skinny and cute. <laughs> <laughs> I was as skinny and cute as she was. <laughs> and so I was waiting always to see on Nightline or some other debate where these two yes. skinny uh, <laughs> African-American women would, would be up against each other. But instead it there was Faye Waddleton and there was, and there was uh, Randy um, uh, from Operation Rescue, sort yeah. of an angry, yeah. an angry white man, yeah. always put up against Faye Waddleton. Just, just an accident? I don't think it so. It was not an accident. It got to be somewhat of a joke in Washington. The entire time that Faye Waddleton was president of Planned Parenthood, she refused to debate me. And uh, she would debate. She said she would only debate someone who was at her same level in the organization. I said, that's not true. She will debate our local volunteer out in Wyoming. But, you know, but okay, if you need me to be president. So we were smart. So I started an organization called Black Americans for Life and made myself president (laughs) (laughs) and said, let's debate. Um, It got to the point that it was humorous. Every Senate office and every congressional office knew because of the Legislative Affairs Department at National Right to Life that if Faye Waddleton was scheduled to testify, they were putting me on beside her and we could count on her counseling. Now, let me show you how awful it was in the media at, uh, we were testifying before the platform committees of uh, the Republican Party on the abortion question, and the, uh, they had me on the same panel with Faye, and literally she did not show up again. I mean, I was fierce. <laughs> I'm telling y'all, y'all ought to go back and look at some of my old tapes. <laughs> um, really fierce. And she didn't show up. Well, the lazy reporter actually didn't show up to the thing, wrote the story, and printed it and had her there. (laughs) But she never showed up. And, you know, I was giving a speech one time, and I knew that they used to tape my speeches and debates and use them for prep and all of that and for opposition research. So I said, Faye, I know you're listening. Hello, Faye, this is Kay. Let's debate. Make my day. And she never did. The entire time. I've actually had people come up to me and said, oh, I really enjoyed that debate between you and Faye Waddleton. And I said, that like never happened. It was legendary, legendary uh, 25 years ago, 20 years ago. But it, in fact, never happened. And and no network ever called her on it saying, saying you can't do, you know, if you want to be on our show, you have to. No one ever said that. They were were complicit. Yeah, everyone was complicit. Uh, if I was scheduled to be, I was scheduled to be on the Today Show. And we, we, we even went as far as to schedule someone else with the understanding <laughs> that they were going to cancel at the last <laughs> minute and I was going to go in. And when, sh- when they told her at the last minute that it was me, she bowed out. And so they canceled the segment. Yeah. And I, w- I mean, I was all prepared to do the, who's that guy who was at the Republican Committee? Convention, the empty chair thing. 
of Clint Eastwood. Yeah, I was going to do the whole Clint Eastwood empty chair thing, and no, they canceled the entire segment. Okay. Questions for anyone here? Well, first of all, um, much respect for what you're doing in terms of like um, teaching critical thinking skills and like having all sides of the debate present. I respect anyone who does that for any issue in any community. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that you mentioned was calling someone a conservative in the black community is kind of equivalent to a dirty word, but you also defined a conservative in the black community as someone who has the audacity to believe what their grandmother taught them. Mm -hmm. So kind of with the, the same with uh, the, pr the progression or egression of the Republican Party in terms of the black community, what happened? Like how, how do we get to that point? Yeah, there's a set of beliefs and ideas that happen to be conservative. People know them as old fashioned or traditional or family values. And it was when they put the term conservative on them that people, you know, conserve what? When you, when, if you, if you feel like you can see the movie, and I'm not encouraging you to do that, by the way, really I'm not, because everyone cannot handle that stuff. And you don't need to be putting that in your head, please. But if you're a culture warrior and God has given you the grace to do it, by all means. Um, when, you, when you do that, you come to understand, when you see that, you come to understand that people are willing to go to great lengths to push back. And when they hear the word conservative, they say, conserve that? What do you want to conserve? I don't want to go back. Go back to that? You've lost your mind. And so people, language means different things to different people. I used to say, if I invited you to dinner at my house on Sunday, what time would you come? Give me a time. Two? Any other time? I invite you to dinner at my house on Sunday. When are you going to come? Somebody's going to come at five, and somebody's going to come at two. In my culture, dinner is right after church on Sunday. It's at two o'clock. And supper is at five. <laughs> so words mean different things to different people. And when you hear the word conservative in the African-American community, bells and whistles go off, flags and flares go up, and people get very concerned. And that's why I hardly ever use it when talking about a certain set of values and a certain set of principles because people can resonate with those but even after they agree to the fact that they believe in those sets of principles they're not sure they want to put the rich white guy who doesn't seem like he understands the plight of black people or poor people in office and there's not enough there to overcome to say these values and these principles are significant and important enough to me that I will set them aside to go vote for him. Yeah. Um, I, d I definitely agree with language being different for different people because I'm from the West, so coming over where it's a little more South, there are all sorts of things like pop and soda and all that. At the same, <laughs> that I don't understand. At the same time, language is really important because mm -hmm. it's the only thing that we have really to sure. communicate with each other. So this kind of this hang up over the word conservative, how can how can we kind of I, or how would you say that we could bring the two together? Do you know what I'm saying? Sure. Like what do you what do you call them? Then? You know, it is oh so easy. It is oh so easy. Conservatives tend to go for the brain and liberals tend to go for the heart, and that's a way overstatement and grossly overstated. But having said that, we are wonkish. And we believe that if we just analyze it enough, describe it enough, uh, produce the data, we can win people. It's not happening, people. Not happening. I remember one of the first lessons that the, my, my, the guy who was responsible for my training at National Right to Life told me. He said, you know, we've got all the data, all of the analysis, all of the stats on our side, but what we never do is name the frog. And I said, what do you mean? He said, do you remember when you were back in biology class, and I don't think PETA lets you dissect frogs anymore in high school, do they? 
you don't get to, oh, you still get to dissect frogs? Okay. Imagine if the frog were alive and you got to play with him and you named him. Then, you know, after you've made friends with them, it's really hard to go through with the dissection. <laughs> you know, you're seeing Kermit and you're seeing Kermit's family and Kermit's cr friends and you can't cut Kermit's guts out anymore. <laughs> Um, Not unless you've watched Django. Uh, unless you've watched Django or you're Tarantino, then you probably could. <laughs> um, so in discussing the abortion issue, he said, Kay, always name the frog. And, you know, I, I had the data. I had the facts. I had the analysis. I had the studies. But unless I could figure out how to talk about that issue, in real terms, in warm terms, in ways that affected people's lives. We, we hire policy wonks on campaigns to do policy. They hire PR people to figure out how to tell the story. We look at how to get the information out and they study demographics to figure out how to appeal to those particular demographics and so I, you know I'm not mad I just take notes I, I, I just want to understand how you win in this environment and in this game and too often we think that being the smartest one in the room is the way to win and maybe being the most caring one in the room is the way to win to care and be smart by the way Given what you're just describing there and also depicting how, um, you know, the black community has felt that conservative movement and the Republican Party has kind of used that community to its own ends and then discarded it, how would you begin to describe what could be considered a genuine effort, outreach, to the African American community that would last, that would mean something as a first step? Well, see, this is why I genuinely believe that Christians have to lead this effort. And it's not necessarily going to be led by the Republican Party. The Republican Party, any party, any political party has one agenda that's to get to 50 plus one. And if you can't help me win an election, then I'm done. And so maybe it's an unrealistic expectation to have of a party anyway. So if we genuinely care about racial reconciliation and about having an, an impact in our minority communities, maybe it has to be left up to someone who genuinely has a heart for those communities as opposed to someone who has to get to 50 plus one. And that's why I believe the church has a very unique responsibility. And that's why I believe that Christians have a very unique responsibility to get the job done. And so, you know, now this comes from someone who's spent 30 years as a, with a career in government and been a professor of government and taught government and encouraged women to go into government and all of that. At the end of the day, and we know this, the answers aren't governmental. Mm -hmm. And I have sort of, you know, a part of my view of what the role of a Christian in government is, is to sort of hold back the rot while the church gets the job done. And so the responsibility of how you genuinely reach across racial lines in order to have an impact you know, I am hoping that people will put that on the hearts of some of the folks graduating from here. It's, it's not, it's not going to happen in any other arena. Um, and if, it, and see, I see this as a matter of if you love America, if you care about the future of this country, you know, I'm trying to make it something that has some significance or meaning to you, you know, out of your own self-interest, 
then it would seem to me that you would care about the fact that minority communities have a strong presence of people in those communities working who are conveying not only the love of Christ but Christian uh, but conservative values and principles because those kids are going to grow up and lead this country. Not you and not your kids. So if you really want to do something for America, how about you spend some time in some urban communities with Hispanic kids, black kids, Asian kids? Because it's happening. The day after Romney lost, I called up any conservative leader who would take my call that day and said, can you hear me now? Because if you didn't get it, maybe you got to get your butt kicked one more time and understand that if you get every white conservative in America to vote for the Republican candidate, you still lose. You still lose. And if you don't figure out how to get youth, minorities, and women. So as far as I'm, I feel so passionately about this because I feel like the future of this country depends on it. And I defy anybody in this room to say you love America more than I do. But if you abandon minority communities, you are abandoning America. And I don't think it's an overstatement to say that. And so if your only interest is how to win elections, then maybe you won't take the time that's required to build relationships. I have a student in my program who is the president of the student body at a historically black college, grew up in an all-black neighborhood, went to an all-black church, went to an all-black high school, went to an all-black college, is going to graduate, and has every reason to believe everything Jeremiah Wright ever said because she's never had a relationship with a white person. And she's going to be running our country. She is going to be running our corporations. She is going to be the president of our universities. So if you care about your baby cousins and the kids you're going to have one day and where this country is going, you might want to consider how do we reach out to those communities and take the message. We've got to get out of holding pep rallies where we all come together, we all think the same, and we get each other ginned up. We've got to be evangelical in our message and figure out how to bring in new people. I'm going to take the last question here because <coughs> I want to ask about the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech that's coming up this summer. And <coughs> from what I read here in World Magazine, and so <coughs> it, must, it must be true, especially <laughs> since, uh, prof since Professor Siller's over here, wrote this article a year ago. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. legend has it wrote part of this 1963 I Have a Dream speech under the huge oak tree out front of the house where you now, yes. which is now yours and where you have Gloucester Institute. So number one, I mean, is that true? Absolutely. And number two, uh, just a little story. How did, how did, how did he happen to be do doing that uh -oh. there? And, and then and just I'll finally- I'll do this as oh, quickly ahead. as I can. Okay. Uh, Dr. Robert Russo Moton was the second president of Tuskegee University and was mentored by Booker T. Washington. He was probably the most well-respected African-American in America in the 1920s, 30s, uh, and died in 1935. He was uh, an advisor to five United States presidents. When he retired from Tuskegee, he came to Gloucester, Virginia, and built a nine-bedroom mansion on the banks of the Gloucester of the York River. And it was there that he opened his home, and he had two things that were so important to him. One was racial reconciliation, and two was the education of the American Negro. 
As a result of that, he immediately opened up his home and started inviting in thoughtful people to debate, and I focus on the word debate, the important issues of the day. Debate means by definition they didn't all agree. And he invited black and white people in to debate the important issues of the day. When he died, he left that home to his daughter and her husband, and her husband became the third president of Tuskegee University. He became so concerned that he continued his father-in-law's legacy and invited thoughtful people in to debate the important issues of the day. In one of those meetings that he convened, they talked about the importance of education for the American Negro, and the United Negro College Fund was founded at this place by Dr. Uh, Robert Russell Moton's son-in-law, Dr. Patterson. So the United Negro College Fund was founded there. This place became known as the cradle of the civil rights movement. Every great civil rights leader in the history of America came there at some point. I went there as a child, and I was taken there by my aunt and uncle, picked up out of the public housing projects of Richmond, Virginia, and I remember sitting on the floor, playing with dolls and reading books, and all I remembered is that the people were beautiful, and they were talking, and the food was really good there. And so when I grew up, I wondered whatever happened to this magical place that I used to be taken as a child. And I actually had an assistant, much like the one who travels with me today, who said, I'll find it for you. We found it, and the place was torn apart, windows blown out, and I had, uh, and it, it had a, a rusted plaque on the building that said this place is on the National Historic Registry for all of the important things that happened here. And I stood on the banks of the river and had what I call my gone with the wind moment, where I said, as God is my witness, I am going to buy this property and launch the next great generation of leaders. What better place to launch the future leaders of this country than the place where Martin Luther King used to come and sit under the tree and write and dream? And I thought future leaders should come there and dream as well. What better place to introduce them to ideas and people and events that they wouldn't get out of their narrow range of experience? And so because of my love of this country and because of the values that I believe so deeply in, I thought they should have a physical home, a place. And so my husband and I stepped out on faith, bought the property, and are in the process of renovating it. And as I age and get older, it's much easier to bring them all to me than for me to travel all over the country. But our goal is to take everything that God has given us in the last 30 to 40 years and pour it into this next generation. And so that's what we do at the Gloucester Institute. And I can't do it without you, by the way. One of my bridesmaids at my wedding when we got married 40 years ago was a young white girl. We've been friends through all those years. And these students found that hard to believe. I have to engage the white community to come in and befriend some of these students because they've never had those kinds of relationships. And they don't believe that they are real. And these are the folks that are going to be leading our country. And so I would encourage the student body here at Patrick Henry, if you want a cross-cultural, cross-racial experience, if you want to get involved, I, I, I won't leave here without saying um, that um, some of you may remember Jessica Wagner, who was your valedictorian 
um, you should talk to Jessica. Jessica left Patrick Henry and ended up in my office saying, I don't know why God has me here. <laughs> and I said, I do. <laughs> and that began a remarkable, remarkable relationship and career. Uh, I love her like a daughter. And if you want to know, she would be an interesting one to talk to about what she learned as a Patrick Henry student. You ought to have her come back and talk about that sometime. And the cultural experience and the cultural shock. And I said, Jessica, you know, I, I, I believe that God has you destined for greatness and you're going to be a major player in this country one day. And because of that, he wants you to get this race thing right. So he sent you here for that. And now you can go to law school. And Jessica's in law school, and she's going to be, she's going to set this world on fire. Uh, and she's a Patrick Henry student. So I've had Patrick Henry students before and uh, would love, if you see that as a part of what you may think God has you called or the next step, just let me know. I hate to bring this to a close, but I thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thanks all those who joined us from a distance and here in person. Remember, come back tomorrow, 1240. Uh, Marvin Olasky will be interviewing Thomas Lake, award-winning writer for Sports Illustrated. And let me just close with a parting thank you to Kay mm -hmm. Coles James. I agree with you about Jessica. She was a student <laughs> in my classes. Uh. She, she, was, she was wonderful. May many of you be called to do the same thing. And please give a warm thank you to Kay Coles James. <laughs> thank you.